Okay, great. So that looks like um, most people have arrived for the moment. Um, so good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is David Morgan. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, and I am the programme manager for Extracts, uh, where I'm responsible for organising a lot of the work around the open calls for our commissioning and touring and for our blueprint. Um, and obviously, this morning's session is a bit of a Q&A um, opportunity. Uh, for people to uh, ask us or send us any kind of questions that you might have around the uh, open call and submission process for Blueprint, which is our uh, research and development strand. Uh, and the open call for that is currently underway just now and has a deadline of uh, Monday the 16th of January. Um, so this morning, uh, I'm pleased to say I'm joined by several colleagues. Um, uh, I'm joined by Clive Little from Certain Blacks, who are one of our partner festivals. Uh, and we also have my colleagues, uh, Danielle and Sarah, uh, on the call, who are helping to facilitate the whole meeting. Uh, as you can see, uh, we do have BSL interpretation in place. And thanks very much to Linda and Ryan, who will be covering that for us. Um, and we should also have kind of live captioning available. Um, so if you're able to click on the CC uh, button, um, if that's something that you use, uh, then please feel free to make use of that. Um, yeah, just to finish introducing myself, uh, my name is David. Uh, I am a white middle-aged male uh, with a sort of long shoulder length kind of dark hair, uh, and I'm wearing a dark blue shirt this morning. Um, I'll maybe also hand over to uh, Clive, who's also on the call as well. Clive, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm a black man with sort of shaggy dreadlocks at the moment. I'm wearing a blue top. My name's Clive Little, and I'm the artistic director of Certain Blacks. And I am a he, him. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much, Clive. Uh, and yeah, just to uh, start with um, a few points about uh, Without Walls and who we are and what it is we do, because uh, I'm sure some of you will be quite new to the network and this might be the first time that you're looking to uh, submit a proposal to us. Um, so Without Walls is a network of outdoor arts festivals um, based across England. Uh, we currently have uh, around 35 partners in the network who are divided across um, both of, uh, or who are divided across several uh, kind of different networks. And um, so the first group that we have is known as our Artistic Directorate Festivals. Uh, and that is a group of 10 organisations who are the ones who are responsible for reviewing and selecting the programme. Uh, then we also have our Touring Network Partnership, um, which is a wider kind of group of around 18 or 19 festivals, uh, many of which are based in uh, what are now classified as Arts Council kind of priority places across the country. Um, and their main focus is on presenting work and kind of opening it up to wider audiences. Uh, and then we have a third network um, of festivals and organisations, which is known as our Creative Development Network. Um, and that is a group of newer or more emerging kind of festivals who we mostly provide kind of networking opportunities and uh, advice to in terms of how to go about programming, presenting their events. Um, but for today's purposes, uh, the group that we're mostly going to be focusing on are our Artistic Directorate Festivals, um, as they're the ones that are responsible for reviewing all the proposals that we receive uh, and going through those. And they're also the festivals who, um, for any shows that we commission, they would be the festivals that are presenting uh, those shows for the first time. Um, that's a little kind of overview of Without Walls. We are basically the, the biggest single kind of commissioner of new outdoor touring work um, for the UK. Um, and I think it's worth saying at the outset that the kind of work that we tend to present um, is work which is suitable for touring in an outdoor festival kind of context. Um, and we'll probably say a little bit more about that kind of as we go along. Um, but just to um, give an idea at the outset, um, what we're 
we're talking about here is very much kind of touring shows. So it's not necessarily work which is kind of site specific, which is created for particular individual kind of locations. It does have to be kind of suitable for touring to multiple festivals um, over uh, the, the course of a season or over a run. Um, and uh, yeah, those are really kind of the key sort of factors that uh, we look at when we're reviewing the proposals that we receive uh, and uh, and when we're deciding what goes into the programme. Um, and a big part of the programming focus for Without Walls is that we're focused on really trying to push the envelope um, in terms of quality and innovation for the kind of outdoor arts work that's getting produced in the UK. Um, a lot of the shows that we've supported over the years have gone on to uh, tour internationally. Um, and some of the shows that you know, we originally kind of supported way back in kind of 2007 or 2008 when the network was first established. Some of those shows are still kind of very successfully kind of out there and touring nowadays as well. Um, so, yeah, the focus of the network isn't just about kind of creating kind of new pieces of work. It's also about kind of trying to ensure the, the touring life and the longevity of those shows. Um, and just to say, we are also kind of recording this morning's session. And um, so that will um, hopefully be available online in the next couple of days. Um, if anyone has missed anything or would like to kind of go back and uh, review uh, any of the kind of questions or any of the answers. Um, so yeah, just to introduce uh, the blueprint scheme as well, um, in terms of the support that Without Walls provides for artists, we have uh, two main kind of open access kind of strands of work. Um, the first of which is our uh, creation and touring support. Um, and that's where we um, basically provide financial support for companies to create new pieces of work um, for touring across the UK. Um, and we also kind of support the touring of that to our kind of festivals. Um, but the main focus of our discussion this morning is on uh, Blueprint, which is our um, open access uh, strand supporting the research and development of new work. Um, so this is very much for projects which might be a very early stage of development. Perhaps you only just have kind of the initial outline or the concept of what it is that you're wanting to do and what you're wanting to explore. Um, and you're basically looking for a way to try and develop that idea further to get it to the stage where you can potentially pitch it as a commissioning idea, either to Without Walls or to any other kind of uh, festivals or partners that you might have out there, um, or get it to the point where you might be able to make a kind of application to the Arts Council to help kind of fund or create it as well. Um, and that's essentially what Blueprint is all about. It's providing that early stage um, support for you to be able to potentially kind of workshop your ideas, uh, maybe bring in other kind of members of your creative team or other kind of performers uh, to try and test out some of what you're working on. Um, or perhaps if, um, if the idea that you have is something which is very innovative from a kind of technological kind of point of view, Perhaps you need some kind of time to uh, develop the infrastructure for that or develop the kind of systems that you're going to be using uh, and test those out. Um, so, yeah, Blueprint is effectively there to uh, try and support all of those different kind of needs and interests. Um, one thing we should say is that um, the way in which our open call process works is that any artist who wishes to submit a proposal is free to do so. Um, the number of proposals that we often receive is often between about 100 and potentially 150 for each uh, open call that we run. And out of that, uh, we would normally be able to support perhaps 10 to 15 kind of projects. Um, so as both uh, the blueprint strand and our kind of commissioning and touring support are very competitive um, kind of schemes. Um, and yeah, we would really encourage people to kind of go on the website and really kind of uh, research the types of projects that we've sorted, uh, selected before and that we've supported before in order to get a strong sense of uh, what it is that the Without Walls Network does and the kinds of work that we, that we support and that we're interested in. Um, and yeah, you know, this is also kind of an opportunity to answer any questions that you might have about that kind of um, submission process. Um, Clive, would you like to say a little bit about the context about your organisation and your kind of event? 
Oh yeah, David. Um, we are certain blacks, and we present a festival called Ensemble Festival. Um, we do it yearly. Um, we present it in the Royal Docks, and we work in partnership with um, Royal Docks Culture Team to put on the festival. Um, it's a diverse festival. So last year we presented um, work from Lives of Clay. We had um, Mimbre um, on uh, Look, Look Mum, uh, No Hands. We also worked with um, Tara Arts to, um, to do, uh, sorry, a show called Final Farewell. And a lot of the work we're looking for is diverse work, but it's not all diverse work. Last year we presented um uh timeless from jolly vianna we work with jolly vianna a lot so we work with a lot of companies and we're very interested in su supporting new work and diverse work um one of the things that we've supported coming through blueprint is been um, bozy um which is making a sort of waterworks um piece of work which is new and so it's a really one thing i'd say about blueprint it's a good chance to play and try out ideas before you bring them to the big festival and stuff so we're we're happy to support anybody anything new ideas and very things which are playful as well yeah absolutely that's great to know and uh, just for anyone who isn't familiar with uh, Bozy, that's a uh, short for bureau of silly ideas um who are very well known um street arts kind of company uh, based in london i think and um, they're very popular kind of on the circuit um, and I think it was interesting that list of artists that you uh, reeled off there, Clive, there's quite a few different kind of art forms sort of represented. Do you want to say a little bit about the different types of work that you present um, for Ensemble um, Festival? We, we, we present, oh, it's, 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 if that's a good question, we present all, lots of work. So um, we present, present things which you can see as straight circus. So we work with Collective and Them this year um, to do a, a show crossing borders. Um, we also have done work with dance and um, did, did uh, different pieces, like one of the commissions we did for, for ourselves was Harmony, which was a two-piece dance, um, um, a, a two-piece dance piece. Um, as was the um, Mimbre piece, which is uh, um, a, a mix of abled and uh, disabled dancers and performers. And uh, we've also done sort of uh, traditional, more traditional-ish um, South Asian dance. I mean, Lives of Clay was a mix of South Asian dance and live pottery, et cetera. So it's a lot of mix of forms. And just straight, um, one of the best things we had last year was the um, big gay, um, the, is, was it the big gay bicycle? Is that um, what it's yeah, um, Big Gay Disco Bike. Yeah, the Big Gay uh, Disco so Bike. I love saying it, and I think I always get it wrong. Big Gay Disco Bike, it, it does what it says on the box. It was a really great performance and um, really good to see in our area, in the Royal Docks, it, and that went down really well with our audiences and stuff as well. So we, we do a wide range of, of, of content and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that's worth drawing out in terms of uh, Without Walls programming um, and their sort of priorities that we have is that really Without Walls covers um, a whole range of different kind of art forms, whether that's um, circus, street theatre, uh, contemporary dance, um, you know, visual art kind of work. And we also we've also supported some digital um, outdoor pieces, and um, but really the key thing that we're kind of looking for is that the work should be suitable for kind of outdoor presentation, um, and I think in Clive's case, as he said, he uh, stages the work in the Royal Docks uh, kind of area of London, um, out in Newham, um, and that's very much kind of presenting work kind of on the street. Um, some of our other festival partners might be presenting work um, in public parks or kind of open spaces or shorefronts um, next to the sea. Um, and we do also have one or two festivals in our network that are green field festivals as well. So they might be presenting work kind of in forests or out in the countryside as well. Um, and for people that are certainly looking for um, creation and touring support for Without Walls, it's very much worth bearing that in mind because um, any shows that we do support will eventually be expected to tour to that whole different range of kind of different festivals and presentation kind of contexts. 
And so I think we're just about ready to move on to starting to answer uh, some questions from people. Um, we do have the Q&A kind of function enabled. So if you'd like to um, type any kind of questions into that as well, uh, we do also have the uh, webinar chat there available as well. Um, we have only had kind of a couple of questions in advance. So um, we're obviously happy to stay on the call um, as long as it takes to kind of uh, field everyone's kind of questions. But yeah, do, do send those in. It may be, um, given the number of folks that we have, it may be that we finish um, slightly earlier than one o'clock kind of as planned. Um, but yeah, just uh, looking over questions that we received in advance. Um, Helen Ottaway had been in touch uh, with several questions um, about a project that they're developing. Um, and um, there's a few kind of questions around that um, in terms of how we sort of separate out um, the research and development kind of phases and the creation kind of phases of a project. Um, and just to kind of answer that point, I think we would very much be led by the artists on where you think your kind of project is at. Um, so uh, we would we'd be very open to supporting ideas from kind of an early stage. Um, but then probably the key question for us is around sort of the timings for our uh, next open calls for commissioning and touring as well. Um, and I think the details of those are what's outlined in the timelines that we've included um, in, the, in the documentation for the process. Um, so uh, in terms of 2024 programming, um, we'd be looking at the open call for that running um, around about June, July, kind of August time next year. Um, so if your intention is to try and um, create work, create new shows to be touring in 2024, then we would really recommend looking at trying to structure your R&D process so that you've been able to carry out as much of that work as possible by the time you kind of submit your proposal. Um, and that's mainly to do with um, the festivals that are looking at your creation and touring proposal, them actually being able to see what has come out of your R&D process um, whether that's kind of visual material or audio visual material um, and being able to get a much clearer idea of what your kind of final vision and idea for the work is. Um, so, uh, so we don't necessarily draw a definite kind of line. Um, if you're looking at how you prepare um, budgets um, around that, then uh, we'd suggest separating out um, the, the work that you're applying to us for the R&D for, have that as sort of a clearly defined kind of part of your budget with the income and expenditure recorded against that. Um, and then you can keep the rest of your um, budgets for creation costs separate. Um, and we'd be able to kind of see those quite clearly, um, no matter which kind of open call it is that you're applying to. Um, uh, Helen was also asking around work in progress kind of sharing. So um, if you are doing a work in progress kind of presentation as part of your R&D process, um, uh, they were asking, would that prevent us from applying to Without Walls for touring support in 2024? Um, and the answer to that is no. We also understand that uh, trying to put work in front of an audience is a very, and getting feedback on it is a very important part of kind of research and development processes. And um, so we're very happy for people to uh, do kind of uh, work in progress sharings as part of your R&D work. Um, and indeed, uh, if you are doing that, we would encourage you to let us know about those um, so that we can invite our kind of festival partners to them as well uh, and try and make sure that we have people that are available to attend those um, or at least catch up on uh, any recordings of them as well. Um, and then Helen's last question uh, was around um, uh, following the R&D process. Um, if Without Walls then goes on to uh, commission or provide touring support for the piece, uh, would the first performance have to be with a member of the consortium? Um, and the answer to that is not necessarily. Um, the, the touring season that we operate tends to run from uh, the start of May through to um, October now. Um, and uh, usually... 
Um, because we have a couple of festivals that take place right at the start of that season, it's often the case that the first uh, festival you might be performing at would be a Without Walls festival. Um, but there's not necessarily a hard prescription that it has to be um, a Without Walls festival. So particularly for work in progress sharings, that's not really an issue. Um, and we would usually find that um, because uh, our earliest festivals are right at the start of the summer season, it's probably more likely that you'd be performing at one of our festivals first, um, but it's not a, a criteria for the funding itself. So I hope that's covered those points for Helen. Um, and I'm just turning to uh, the Q&A now. Uh, and first question that we have here is from uh, Max Percy. Um, who's asking, uh, what stage artists are you looking to support? Would you consider early career artists, um, but with some experience of outdoor work? Um, and the answer to that one is that, uh, yeah, basically anyone uh, is able to apply to Without Walls. Um, we would uh, very much encourage people, if it is your first time thinking about creating outdoor work, we would certainly encourage people to um, go out there and do the research. So try and find out a bit more about kind of the types of festivals that we work with um, and the sort of context in which they present work. Um, and you should be able to find information about that on the Without Walls website. Um, the list of all our festival partners is there. Um, and there should also be kind of various bits of video material um, on our website or on our YouTube page that will give you an idea of what those festivals kind of look like and sound like. Um, and how they how they tend to stage the work, um, and of course you know there's there's nothing better than actually being able to attend festivals uh, live and in person as well. Yeah, Clive, I can see you've got a hand up. Yeah, I mean you could also use the opportunity if you're fairly new to working outdoors uh, is to work with partners and to find partners that 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 have got experience of presenting work outdoors. Um, for example, I've worked with a company called Out of Order, and one of the ideas they wanted to do was fly a piano um, through the stage, and they got some blueprint money. They were, they partnered with Rockles of Razor that had experience of doing that sort of um, flying and that making that sort of apparatus. So it always helps that if, if you look out there and see um, who else has got experience if you're fairly new to that sector. Great, fantastic. And I think that's yeah, a really good recommendation because, you know, um, artists are free to kind of approach any of our sort of partner festivals as well at any point uh, and be trying to build relationships directly with those organisations as well. So there's absolutely nothing to prevent you um, from doing that. And also going out and seeing work is one uh, great way of doing that. Um, Mish Weaver is asking, uh, could you talk us through the application process? Um, application forms create a particular type of hell for some of us. Uh, so I'm interested in how I can get my ideas across to you. Um, yeah, and we certainly kind of recognise that, um, you know, it can feel kind of quite bureaucratic sometimes, trying to express your ideas as best as possible in something which is very much a kind of um, preset out kind of form. Um, but I think the thing that I would say about that is that um, the thing that is really going to help projects uh, kind of come across and that is really going to help uh, programmers get a sense of what it is that you're trying to achieve is really through the description of the work. Um, so I think that's the main thing to kind of focus on is just trying to articulate your idea as clearly as possible and in the most exciting and kind of engaging way um, possible. Um, so obviously, you know, there are various sections of the forms which are all about finances and so on. But the key thing is really trying to describe and sell the idea. And I think that's the, that's the main thing to kind of uh, concentrate and focus on. And the more that you're able to paint the picture for programmers of what your idea or what your piece of work is going to look like or sound like. And that's the thing that's gonna really help it leap off the page um, and make it feel like a really exciting and engaging and innovative piece of work. And um, so that's the thing I would really recommend that we focus on. Um, in terms of the technicalities of this mission process itself, um, we obviously have the online form uh, that we ask people to use to submit the information to us. Um, however, you can also um, 
if you wish, submit uh, video responses to certain sections of the form as well, particularly those where you're describing uh, your work. Um, so if that's something that you feel like you might be more comfortable with, then you can uh, certainly use that as an option. Um, and we also, we also recognise that um, you know, there might be a whole range of different kind of access requirements that people have as well. Um, so in order to try and make the process kind of less challenging for people, um, we have our colleagues here at Extracts who are able to provide you with uh, support and advice about how you might kind of access uh, different options um, for submitting your proposal. Um, and Danielle, who's uh, one of our colleagues that's on the call today, um, he fields all of those kind of requests. Uh, we do now have a budget which enables people to uh, request some financial support. So, for example, if you need an access kind of worker or assistant to help you prepare your uh, kind of proposal or application, uh, then that's something that you can request support from directly. Um, and it might be that either one of the extracts team might be able to help you uh, with kind of filling out the proposal, um, or you can engage somebody else that you might want to work with, uh, whether those are BSL interpreters, if you'd like to submit video kind of proposals, um, or general kind of access workers to help with, um, you know, typing up your proposals, um, if you have kind of dyslexia or dyspraxia or any other uh, kind of uh, condition that makes it a bit more kind of difficult to produce kind of written uh, or kind of number based kind of work. And we're certainly very happy to uh, help people with all of those kind of options as well. Uh, and I think uh, my colleague Danielle um, has just popped some more information about that in the chat as well as to how you can kind of contact us um, if you'd like to follow up on any of those points. Uh, next question coming up, Matt Rudkin uh, is asking, can you give an indication of how you're using the term dramaturgy in the application notes? Uh, I'm aware that people use this term in quite different ways. Uh, and would you hope to see storyboarding, for example, in the application itself? Um, Clive, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, um, thanks uh, uh, for that. Dramaturgy, we, we're using it more in the way of how you see your show and the flow and ebb of your show and how you're going to present the show. So we're not really looking for storyboarding, but um, what we're looking for is something which is a bit more in-depth than just um, uh, a, a straight presentation of, a, say you're going to straight presentation of a story or a straight presentation of what you're seeing, just more how you're going to feel if it's a circus show, say. A lot of the time we've got circus um, shows which are just presenting the skills rather than presenting a story arc or a, uh, an arc. So it's more about how you're going to use dramaturgy to sell your story to your audiences rather than just present, say, a group of, of acrobats or show. That's what we're looking for with the dramaturgy. Hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Clive raises really a really good point there, which is that um, a lot of the kind of work that gets presented in outdoors is often non-verbal. Um, so people might be might not be working with uh, pre-prepared kind of scripts. If you have something which is like a circus-based show um, or a clowning-based show, uh, then that might be all completely told through kind of physical storytelling. Um, and what we're really interested in there is sort of the structure of the work and how you're able to hold the audience's attention and communicate the action to them as you're going through each sort of phase of the story. Um, and I think, you know, as, as you're rightly saying, you know, dramaturgy can mean a lot of different things depending on different kind of forms. Um, so, um, you know, a piece of work which is digitally kind of based, uh, you know, that's going to mean something very different again. Um, so I think what we're really kind of interested and concerned about there is the relationship that the audience kind of have with the show and um, what is the nature of the audience's interaction with the work, with the performers, um, and how are you able to kind of engage and hold their attention um, throughout the show. And those are the sorts of things that we're really interested in finding out about and uh, yeah, people potentially kind of expanding on. Um, 
Next question from Gwen Hales, um, who's asking, can you expand on the meaning of the categories large scale and digital? Um, and yes, yeah, certainly. So a uh, large scale um, is something that I think has a particular kind of meaning in the outdoor arts um, because we are not necessarily encumbered by uh, having to make work fit in a particular kind of box or a particular kind of theatre space. Um, you can find that in the outdoors we get things which are very kind of large scale shows. Um, and you might see at a festival like, for example, Stockton International Riverside Festival, and they present quite large scale work as their headline shows, particularly for kind of uh, the evening kind of performances over the course of a weekend. Um, but for the purposes of Without Walls, uh, when we're talking about large scale, what we're really thinking about here is um, particularly the size of audience that you're going to be able to attract for a particular piece of show or a particular piece of work. Um, and in the outdoors, um, we'd often think about large scale work having audiences in the thousands of people or potentially even the tens of thousands of people, uh, rather than just kind of being in the hundreds. Um, so, yeah, that kind of large scale work will often be very kind of spectacular. Um, you might see uh, festivals presenting things like kind of crane shows where they're flying kind of sets from kind of uh, a crane. And um, you might see shows using kind of large scale projection uh, or anything like that. And um, so it's really anything that takes place on a much bigger and kind of grander scale. Um, and maybe has uh, sort of tens of thousands of people involved. Um, and then I think the other kind of part of that question was also about how we define digital work. Um, and uh, we take quite a broad sort of interpretation of that. Um, so if, um, so that could be anything that involves any kind of digital element. So previously Without Walls has presented pieces of work which are kind of app based, they're almost kind of audio tour experiences, which you can download to your phone. Um, we've also presented work which um, uses interactive digital elements. So we've had things which are like visual art installations, um, but the audience can interact with them by kind of uploading information through a particular kind of website and so on. Um, and yeah, I think anything that uses sort of um, video mapping or digital projection would probably fall within those kind of categories as well. Um, what I would say is that um, if the digital element is a more minor part of the work, so say, for example, what you're planning is something like a large scale dance performance, which is also going to use kind of video mapping elements. I would maybe kind of classify that more as kind of a dance project first, but then specify that it also has digital as kind of one of its additional kind of elements or art forms as well. And um, you got any thoughts on that, Clive? On what constitutes digital? Um, yeah, it, it, it's 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 um, uh, there have been pieces of work like um, arrivals and departures, which we had a couple of years ago, which displayed um, people's names that we'd lost during C nineteen and people that arrived. That that I saw as a, a very good um, um, digital um, piece. It was quite large when you saw it, but you had digital interaction with people actually uh, emailing in. Um, particular people's particular names to put on that uh, piece of work there's also the robot selfie as well which again it looks large but um, a lot of participants um, can have their their picture taken and then email that in and then that gets made and I'd see that as a pure as a very digital piece which people can see um, outdoors and quite large scale so those are the two I'd highlight in the last couple of weeks yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks. And I think uh, Danielle's uh, popping some links to those in the chat as well. Um, Robbie Graham. Hi, Robbie. Great to see you. Um, uh, they're asking, is there a specific scale of work that will be prioritised for this round of Blueprint? Um, interested to know what scale of work programmers and festival budgets are allowing for post-COVID. And this might well be one that uh, bring uh, Clive in on as well. Um, I would say that Without Walls never really kind of prioritises particular scales of work. Um, but I think at the moment in the current uh, financial and economic context, um, it's very worthwhile um, artists and creatives 
thinking about the practicalities of how you're going to tour and present that work. Um, I don't know, Clive, have you got particular thoughts on this at the moment before I say any more? For medium to large scale work and presenting it, it really, you really do need to, to take into account um, everything from, from the site that you need to the infrastructure that you need. Um, this year, we presented two pieces of work, which I'd say were medium scale, and that was the, the timeless piece and the collective and then No Man's Land. Both of those needed. No Man's Land was a seven metre um, rig that we put up and um, we had to um, secure it with, with um, concrete blocks because we're not in that grass land. That was quite a big thing for us. And it's the on cost. It's not just the performance. It's the on cost of bringing such big risk uh, um, rigs and stuff. But we're looking at it again with, with with different pieces of work, and it and it does depend. You've got to weigh up how much it costs to put the thing up and um, put the work up um, to how much then you get that um, bigger audience impact. So we're still looking to do medium to large scale work because our audiences there's still a demand for it, and especially post COVID to get things get things out there which people can now come and celebrate. It'd be really good, but it is we do look at the on costs and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just to be clear, when Clive's talking about kind of on costs there, that's referring to anything that the festival might kind of have to provide, um, which you as an artist aren't necessarily kind of touring with yourself. So that might include things like staging hire, sound and PA hire, um, truss hire, um, and uh, yeah, all of those kind of associated costs that go around it. Um, now, just to come back to kind of Robbie's question at the moment, because I think it is a kind of a good and interesting point. Um, I think that uh, really what we've found over the last year or year and a half is that there's also been a very large kind of escalation uh, with the inflation that kind of everyone's experiencing, whether that's kind of you know, at home or at work. Um, I think back at the start of this year, um, we were getting feedback from our festival partners that a lot of their kind of staging costs were increasing quite dramatically. Um, so I think we're talking for a lot of people um, presentation costs might have increased by, you know, even around 20% or 30% over the co course of the last year. Um, so I think if you are kind of looking at creating work which is on a bit of a kind of larger scale, then I'd really think very carefully about how you are planning the infrastructure for that to try and make the whole kind of show as kind of tourable and as affordable as possible. And so you're trying to really kind of minimize that kind of um, footprint that you have. And I think potentially even more than is the case with large scale work. I think uh, even kind of medium scale shows need to be thinking about this as well. Um, I think what we found through our last open call for creation and touring support was that we were getting a lot of proposals for shows that were um, planning to have maybe 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 people kind of on the road. Um, and I think it's really worthwhile um, producers and artists Bearing in mind that, you know, in certain parts of the country now, uh, we're looking at kind of hotel costs of, uh, you know, over £150 per person per night. Um, so even though um, you might be planning something which kind of works out as a workable kind of artist's fee for what you think you should be able to kind of charge, I think it'd be well worthwhile sort of thinking about things very much from the festival's kind of point of view uh, and everything else that they're going to need to kind of put in place, such as kind of hotel rooms, such as per DMs, such as, you know, equipment kind of hires um, that are really going to affect kind of uh, the affordability of the work from the festival's kind of point of view. And because there are a lot of additional kind of costs involved over and above just the fees that you're charging kind of as an artist. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good Good kind of point to bring up and thanks for uh thanks for raising that um you know again you know just to be clear we're not putting any sort of specific kind of limits on the types of work that you should apply for um but i think it's well worth being aware that if you are planning things on a larger scale at the moment and um, that is potentially going to be kind of quite a competitive kind of part of the market um, and it might be that you don't necessarily see more than kind of a few large scale shows 
being presented or supported kind of um, across the company, uh, across the country um, through uh, any kind of various rounds. So I think that's a, a very good kind of issue to be aware of and to be thinking about. Um, Sham Dittani, uh, hi there. Uh, they're asking how quick a turnaround would be advised for R&D and creation? Would it be possible to do both within the next six months? Um, so I would say that um, the timescales that we would be working with for Without Walls um, are that we've already kind of programmed our kind of commissions for 2023 just now. Um, so what we'd be looking at is um, for our next open call for creation support, that'd be for shows that are premiering and touring in 2024. Um, and what that means in terms of the time scale um, is that at the moment, we would be giving kind of R&D kind of awards um, people would be able to kind of go away and kind of work in that kind of essentially over the summer kind of next year. Um, and then if they're planning to kind of premiere the work in 2024, uh, then our open call process for that would be towards kind of the end of next summer. Um, and uh, yeah, we would be making funding decisions around that uh, round about kind of October time. Um, so you then have that sort of October through to May kind of period, October 2023 to May 2024, which would effectively be kind of your uh, creation and development period uh, for the final kind of turnaround. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the, the timeline for uh, that process. Clive, do you have any thoughts on that? No, it, it's best to give yourself um, a good run in because, as I say, if you get Blueprint this year, um, we as a network won't be able to show it until 2024. And it's good, you know, trying to turn around R&D and produce a show in six months is tight. And you do need to have a few sharings, get feedback. And, and what the Blueprint process allows you is the chance to 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 play demonstrate get your work out there and maybe get some feedback to what you might want to develop into a bigger uh, application so you know you've got that year to make it and then uh, put in an application so I, i'd be looking at that sort of time scale yeah absolutely and in terms of uh, you know anyone who's thinking about doing their r&d over a longer kind of time scale as well and um, we know that Without Walls has just had its funding renewed for the next kind of uh, three years. So that will be from 2023 to 2026. So certainly um, if you're wanting to apply for R&D support just now for projects which might not happen until 2025, uh, then that's certainly kind of an option as well. Um, and you can look at building your sort of timelines and schedules around that if that's something that you're interested in. Um, Ella Mesma is asking, uh, is it an issue if we are mid-career but new to outdoor work? Um, and note that shouldn't be an issue at all. Um, we don't put, there is no specific focus for Without Walls in terms of uh, where people are in their careers or uh, necessarily even whether they've produced or created kind of outdoor work before. Um, it's very, our focus is very much on kind of the, the quality of the work and the quality of kind of the ideas. And that's really kind of the, the core thing that we're looking to support. And um, so certainly in the past, you know, we've commissioned shows from people that are very experienced in kind of um, outdoor work. Uh, we've commissioned shows from people that are creating their, their first piece of outdoor work um, for the first time um, and kind of everything in between. Um, so, uh, so yeah, certainly please don't um, feel put off in any way um, by, you know, what sort of stage you feel at you're at in your own kind of creative development or your experience of kind of the outdoor arts. Um, it really is kind of the quality of the ideas is the main thing that we're concerned about and kind of looking at. Uh, Next question from Sarah Jane Codd. Uh, can part of the R&D be used to dedicate to attracting a more diverse mix of performers for the project? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, it is the area in which we're based, Bremsey and Hull, but we struggle to find and train skilled performers from different ethnic backgrounds. Um, I think that's a very good uh, kind of thought. You know, certainly we'd encourage everyone to be kind of thinking about that uh, in terms of their casting, in terms of kind of collaborators that we're working with. Uh, Clive, do you want to come in there? No, it's it, it's it's a good way of looking at how um, you present your work and who you present it with. You know, having a bit of time to think about your casting, who who your partners might be, if you're looking at more diverse partners. 
Um, as an organization, obviously, uh, Certain Blacks is always looking for diverse work. And we understand that uh, work is made in different areas of, of, um, of, of England. So it'd be really good to use that to, to make partners and look at who you might work with or who might be in your show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can definitely kind of look at that as part of your plans for kind of the R&D process. Um, and if you feel that there are any kind of financial kind of factors that are involved in that as well, then by all means do kind of build those into your budget um, for what you're proposing um, and give us a sort of clear indication of that so that we're able to uh, see that and kind of understand that when it comes to um, analysing your budget. Uh, Carol Keating is asking, uh, hi there, I'm interested in proposing a participatory live art experience. Uh, do you have preferred scales of audience capacity for participatory work? Um, Clive, have you got any thoughts on that one? Um, it, it depends what the type of work is and also what sort of infrastructure you need for the participation stuff. I've seen um, really good um, audience participation things uh, done with uh, audiences of 50 to 100, um, depending on what spaces you've got. It does depend if um, festivals have got that space for that sort of type of audience. Um, where I saw it was a greenfield site, so um, it does depend on that. But we are looking at developing more participatory work. Definitely live art stuff is we're very interested in. And it, you should really, I think, think about what um, venues or what festivals you might want to present it at, because that might uh, influence um, the sides of participation and, and stuff. Because we did something this year and it was about 10, 15 people taking part in this rope trip, which is just about what we just about the size we could do it. We couldn't do anything more, but that's just because we're on a smaller site. So that's going to influence it as well. Yeah, and I think you know one of the interesting things about outdoor arts is that um, it's possible to create kind of participatory work on all manner of scales. And so obviously you can have things which are, you know, quite small, intimate, close kind of interactions with your audience. Um, but, you know, a lot of kind of festivals that we work with will also have participatory projects that are really at the large kind of scale. Um, and you often find this with parading work as well. And um, so a lot of festivals like Brighton Festival or Stockton Festival um, have community led kind of parades that are a big part of their kind of program uh, and a big part of their kind of event. And um, what I would say is that if you're thinking about something which is that kind of um, parading sort of work, um, the thing to really think about there in a without walls context is how you would potentially present that in different festivals and different locations and how much time you would need to be spending with the participants in the build up to the event and then the build up to the festival um, because in a lot of those kind of projects it's very much kind of the process and that engagement that you have with people um, which is a key part of the work um, and then at the other end of the scale um, you know certainly we've had um, some shows in the past which were uh, kind of almost one-on-one -on -one kind of performances um, and I think the the thing there is to be very clear about how many people you think you would be able to interact with um, over the course of the day or over the course of kind of a weekend. And um, sometimes those shows tend to be more durational. Um, so you're doing kind of one performance or one event kind of straight after another. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, but again, I think when it comes to participatory work, it's very important to be kind of led by the idea um, and to really focus on describing that as well as possible um, and what that interaction uh, with the participants is going to be. I think that's always kind of the really crucial thing to try and get across. Uh, I can see that uh, Sophia Akbar is uh, on as well. 
uh, and she's saying uh, someone inquired if mapping projects had been successful in the past. Uh, any considerations about daytime shows versus nighttime? Um, so yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think what you're referring to there, um, Sophie, is uh, obviously kind of video mapping kind of projects. Um, I think we have had uh, shows in the past which have included elements of video projection to them. Um, obviously, I think the thing with video mapping specifically is that and that's something that you would adapt to each kind of location where you're presenting it. Um, so if you're putting together a proposal, I think it's very important to be clear about the sort of time that you'd need to spend on site in order to create that kind of uh, mapping interaction. Um, because that will be a very big consideration for partners when it comes to being able to book it. Um, and uh, the other thing that um, the partners would be looking at is sort of the availability of sites as well, um, because obviously they would need to negotiate access to whatever buildings or whatever locations um, that you'd be looking to present the work at. Um, and then the second that part of that question was uh, considerations about daytime shows versus nighttime shows. Um, Clive, have you got thoughts on that? Um, a, lot, a lot of the time, um, because we're summer festivals, it depends what time of year your festival is in. So our festival's middle of July. At the moment, we don't do any nighttime um, work because it just means our, it makes our festival really long. Uh, it would go 12 till when's when sundown, nine. It, we'd have to put shows on at 10 o'clock at night. So we don't currently do that, but other festivals do do it. And they're on the other types of times of year. We might look at expanding what we do at some point, but presently we don't do any nighttime stuff because we're just in the middle of summer. Yeah, and I think that's a really important consideration um, to think about there is that the, the networks for daytime work and kind of nighttime work uh, can tend to be quite different. So what we've seen over the last 10 years is a real expansion in uh, things like light festivals uh, taking place between uh, maybe October and February each year. And they've become really kind of popular events for a lot of local authorities um, and a lot of producers. Um, and uh, they present obviously lots of kind of illuminated kind of work or maybe fire-based kind of work, things like fire gardens and so on. Um, but yeah, as Clive says, they're obviously um, in some ways more suited to the parts of the year where you do have uh, the long hours of darkness. Um, and a lot of the Without Walls festivals tend to be more kind of summer based festivals. Um, so particularly at the height of summer, they might have very limited hours of darkness. Um, uh, and some of the some of the consequences of that are that um, obviously it's going to be very difficult to present shows that have a lot of video projection work. It's going to be very difficult to present those during daylight hours because you just simply won't be able to kind of see uh, the video kind of content. Um, so that type of work is usually more suited to kind of an after dark kind of context. Um, but at the same time, um, because uh, after dark kind of opportunities are a bit more limited in terms of the, the range of kind of programming that you can put on around them. Uh, what you might find is that festivals are looking to present, certainly summer festivals would be looking to present work which is potentially kind of slightly kind of larger in scale um, and which can certainly kind of hold its own as a standalone performance. Um, a lot of the daytime festivals, they'll present different pieces of work back to back to back throughout the course of the day. Um, and then once you get to the evening time, you know, a lot of the daytime audience might kind of disappear. Um, and if people are going to come out in the evening, then that's going to usually be for something which is a bit more kind of eye catching and a bit more of a standalone kind of event um, in its own right. Um, so it's well worth kind of thinking about that um, when you're thinking about ideas for kind of after dark work. 
Uh, and then I think we've got a kind of last question here in the Q&A at the moment. And if anyone else has anything you want to ask, then do type that in just now and we'll make sure and try and cover it. And um, But Carol Keating is asking, uh, what scale of funding will be offered by the Creation Fund? Um, and I think some information about previous rounds may still be available on our website. Um, but in terms of the range of kind of uh, grants that we award for creation and touring funding, um, usually the largest kind of size of requests that we receive, or certainly the largest requests that we've funded, um, have been for anything up to about 50,000 or 60,000 uh, pounds in terms of the Without Walls contribution towards creation costs. Um, and most kind of projects and proposals that we receive um, are for kind of a fair bit less than that. Um, when we talk about creation and touring support, um, it is possible to apply to as just for kind of touring support. So if you have a show which you've already managed to kind of create through your own resources, uh, then you can apply to us just to get an offer of festival dates from our partners. Um, and there wouldn't necessarily be any request for cash funds attached to that. Um, a lot of the grants that we might kind of award to companies might be in the sort of 10 to 20,000 pound range. Um, but as we were discussing earlier with you know, inflation and with the increasing costs that everyone's faced in the last couple of years, um, this is something that we're uh, trying to keep quite a close eye on uh, over the next kind of couple of years in terms of how everyone's budgets are being impacted. Uh, I'm just scanning... Uh, I'm just scanning this question from Melanie Whitehead, who is asking, um, is there a document that summarizes all the different festival opportunities and types uh, and the calendar year of when they take place? Um, so I think there's a couple of bits of information that you can refer to there. Um, so I think in the guidance notes, and um, that has an outline of the provisional timeline for our artistic director at festivals, um, which is also a particular kind of set of festivals. Um, but the other thing that I would recommend there as well is if you're not already familiar with Outdoor Arts UK, um, they are a network and kind of development organisation um, for the whole outdoor arts sector in the UK. And they maintain a very good a kind of listings email and um, so every week they send out kind of an update um, part of which contains a whole list of all manner of events that take place over the course of the year and um, so that's a really good um, source of research um, for figuring out what events are out there and when they kind of tend to take place throughout the year as well um, and uh, Danielle, if you're able to maybe kind of call up the um, internet link for Outdoor Arts UK as well uh, and drop that in the chat, then uh, that'd be great. Um, John Hicks is asking, it's a follow-on point from uh, what we're just discussing there, and um, please would you explain how one applies for festival dates from partners but no financial support for production? Um, so that would normally be as part of our creation and touring kind of open call, uh, which is the one which will be taking place again next summer. Um, all you do is you'd submit your proposal um, through that as normal, um, but you just submit it without any kind of request for kind of creation support. Um, and we then kind of review those kind of um, proposals as part of that whole programming kind of process. Um, Clive, have you got any kind of thoughts there around uh, those matters or those aspects of the process? Not really. It's, um, uh, you know, once you've done your blueprint, and um, if you come to us and you think the work is already made, then you're not looking for the commissioning part of it. You're just looking for the support for the touring. So we'll be paying you just to present <laughs> other people that we're, we're commissioning the new work. The partners for the main touring, the partners will put in particular money for new commissions um, along with without walls if you need to the money to make the work and then get it on tour. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, hopefully that's kind of quite a straight, uh, straightforward process if you're just looking in the long run to apply for uh, touring support. Um, I think, yeah, something to kind of just highlight there as well is that one of the key focuses for Without Walls is very much about um, supporting the presentation of new pieces of work. And um, so if you're thinking about submitting something for touring support in the future, 
Um, if you've already had kind of a few performances of that show, uh, then um, we would consider that as being kind of uh, eligible uh, to apply for kind of touring support. And um, if it's a show that's already been kind of touring for, you know, a full season of work, maybe it's had kind of half a dozen performances or more, then that would maybe start kind of falling into the category of as considering that kind of more as an existing kind of piece of work rather than a newly created kind of one. Um, so those are some of the kind of factors that we think about and that we kind of take into account at that stage um, if people are applying for touring support. Um, so I hope that is helpful. Uh, and I'm just quickly checking to see if there are any more kind of questions in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, I think that's the last question that we've had there. Oh, yeah, Ella has one more question. We'll just give it a second or two for. Here we go. Um, yeah, so I was asking, uh, I have a piece which I've done some bits of R&D on and that I now want to fully realise. Uh, I've done some performances though. Uh, it will be a cast of three. Is this considered a new piece still? Um, so yeah, as long as um, it's not kind of reached what you are intending its final form to be, uh, then that's absolutely fine. And as we were saying earlier, we totally understand that doing things like work in progress kind of sharings or development uh, kind of sharings um, is a really important kind of part of the process for uh, trying to bring together a really strong and kind of responsive kind of piece of work. And um, so, yeah, you're absolutely fine to, you know, carry out whatever kind of test performances that you like. Um, and uh, yeah, if your intention in the long term is to sort of adapt it and expand it and kind of grow it into a, a fuller, a kind of more expansive kind of piece of work, then yeah, that's something that we're very happy to support. So yeah. So I think that's us covered all the questions that we've received there. Um, as I was saying, we shall be making this recording available um, over the next few days, which should be on a kind of website uh, and our YouTube pages. Um, so yeah, I think it just remains to say thank you very much uh, to Clive for joining us this morning. That was much appreciated. Uh, and also to Ryan and Linda and Lee, who've all been helping us out with the access facilities as well. Um, and if you have kind of any further questions that you want to ask at any point between now and the uh, submission date on the 16th of January, uh, then you can feel free to kind of just contact us directly via email or through any of our kind of social media channels. Um, and we'll be more than happy to answer those. Thanks very much. And I hope everyone has a good break over Christmas and the new year. <laughs>